I want to say thank you for our team from Los Angeles City Planning. We're very happy to have with us today, Claire Kelly, Eric Lopez, and, Eric Col and Aaron Coleman. And we will uh, also have Michelle Levy facilitating the discussion with the architects that will help frame this discussion. And they include Sarah Lawrenson, who is the chair of the Government Outreach Committee, along with Nathan Bishop, Hava Danielson, Tracy Stone, and Kelly Von Otengim. I should have asked Kelly how to pronounce her name, but Kelly Von Otengim. So with that, I'm gonna um, encourage and welcome Sarah to say a few words before we introduce the team from LA City Planning. And Sarah, if you don't mind just sharing a little bit of uh, background on the Government Outreach Committee, and then we'll, we'll get our conversation started. Thank you. Thanks, Will. Yeah, so the, nice to see everybody. And uh, we're really happy to have members of, of the LA City Planning here with us. Uh, so the Government Outreach Committee, which is named um, AIA LA Go with an exclamation mark, um, is really sort of set up to talk to, to various uh, agencies around uh, the city and the county to, to kind of help, help us understand kind of what the new, what is happening within their agencies, how we can help them kind of by giving the architect's viewpoint as to what's working and what's not working and to be really be in dialogue and open dialogue with various members of um, city, city groups, including planning, particularly planning and, and uh, the building department where we have a lot of interaction. So we're really happy about this, uh, these kinds of uh, uh, exchanges. And uh, we're really grateful to have the members of the ZIP team uh, to give us their planning overview of the new zoning system and how the new code will impact all of our projects. Um, so the, the planning department has really rolled out a draft plan for downtown LA, which has a lot of information uh, for us all to digest and to look at. And they also have an amazing interactive map where you can see lot by lot how the new zoning may work. So we're really eager to to kind of be in dialogue with them as they roll this out. And thank you. Thanks, Sarah. So Aaron and Eric and Claire, welcome. We look forward to your presentation and um, we will then have the discussion with Michelle Levy. Okay, great. Well, I'll take the first couple of slides and hi everyone, I'm Michelle Levy. It's really great to see many of you um, uh, who are familiar faces and, New, new folks I haven't met yet. Um, so uh, I'll just quickly go over the, um, the agenda for this afternoon. We're going to give a quick overview um, of the new zoning code. Um, we're going to talk about you know, the policies of the downtown community plan. Claire is going to cover that. And then um, Aaron and Eric are going to cover the key code improvements and talk about next steps. Um, afterwards, we'll have a facilitated discussion and I'm your facilitator today um, for about 30 minutes. And um, afterwards, we'll answer general questions um, from the audience. Next slide, please. Um, and so we've already gone over some introductions, but for those who joined in progress, um, today you're gonna to be hearing from Eric Lopez from LA City Planning, Claire Kelly, um, Aaron Coleman, and myself. And Eric and Aaron are on our, what we're calling our ZIP team, Zoning Integration Program team. And they're really um, responsible for rolling out the new zoning code with each community plan update. And Claire represents our downtown LA community plan update team. And she's been working on the downtown community plan and she'll talk about that. Um, we're also very excited to be joined by Nathan Bishop, Hava Danielson, Sarah Lorenzen, Kelly Van Odegem, hopefully I got that right, um, and Tracy Stone um, as our panelists. And uh, next I'll hand it off to Aaron. Or Eric, I'm sorry, who's It'll going be, next? Yeah, sorry. Okay, uh, sorry, Eric, go ahead. 
Just, uh, my uh, PDF uh, acrobats uh, being decided to be a little glitchy today. <laughs> Uh, so apologies. Um, so I, we wanted to sort of get off to a, sort of a big picture start here and making sure uh, we all at least had some awareness of uh, how the new zoning code is organized and generally functions. Uh, it should help uh, for uh, for some navigating of the new uh, the new landscape here. Uh, so yeah, I think we'll start off with um, if it'll switch slides for me. <laughs> There we go. Uh, just a little bit of background on the, on the program. Uh, we launched officially back in uh, July of 2013, uh, where we immediately sort of went, went into a uh, round of listening sessions, uh, uh, both, both with uh, individual stakeholder groups. Uh, I believe uh, the AIA uh, was one of the, was a participant in some of those early listening sessions. Um, and also with uh, members of the general public. And we went around uh, across the whole city and essentially gathered a lot of the feedback and, and wishes for what a new zoning code uh, would deliver. Uh, and that ultimately led to our zoning code evaluation report, which uh, served as uh, our, our map, a roadmap, or, or at least a checklist of things that we needed to make sure were in the, in the new draft. Um, then, uh, you know, over the years, we had uh, several uh, public forums and workshops. Uh, where we uh, went over, introduced some concepts, uh, and then uh, refined uh, from there uh, and sort of try to build uh, a little more collaboratively, uh, like the, the groundwork for what the new zoning system should be. Uh, we also had uh, two advisory committees that were formed uh, for uh, to help guide the work. Uh, the first would be the Zoning Advisory Committee. Uh, that uh, is made up of a series of stakeholders that represent uh, different parts of the city, but also different uh, aspects of uh, the, uh, the people involved uh, at the different levels of development in the city of Los Angeles. Um, so altogether, we had over 200 outreach events uh, where we reached over 6,500 people. Um, and I think the big, the big picture here is like the objectives for the new zoning code. Uh, where we wanted to ensure that you know based on what we've heard uh that the that the new zoning code have all the tools uh, needed to implement a wide range of community visions uh we also needed a zoning code that was adaptable to the current and also future policy needs those that we may not know about that we need to adapt to uh and uh we wanted it to also be the primary source for zoning regulations uh and i think more importantly uh we wanted it to be a little more visual uh, and easier to read uh, and essentially understand better and, and easier to navigate. Uh, so those are the main objectives for the, for the new zoning code. Uh, so you see here the new zone string. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a modular zoning system that builds off of uh, a lot of what, uh, a lot of the innovations that have occurred in zoning uh, since it first started uh, 200, like about, about 100 years ago. Uh, so, you know, we built off of uh, some of the best, the best for Euclidean, for uh, performance zoning, uh, form based code, um, incentive uh, based uh, program. So we sort of have come, come together and put together a, a, uh, a zoning system that we believe kind of brings out the best of those, uh, at least for the city of Los Angeles. Uh, so what we've done here is leaned into a modular zoning system uh, that addresses the built environment and uh, separately from uh, the activities or the types of uses that are permitted. So um, the form districts uh, refer to the building size, like the mass of a building. Uh, frontages uh, address the relationship of a site uh, or those buildings uh, to the street or other types of uh, right of way that we're interested in. Uh, and then development standards is an acknowledgement that uh, not every part of the city has the same uh, sort of orientation. Uh, some have less of an emphasis on, on uh, the, the single rider vehicle and others uh, are a lot more walkable. So, so the, the modularity here allows us to scale to whatever is appropriate. Uh, and then uh, the use districts establish uh, very clearly uh, what uses are permitted for each district because uh, currently uh, the zoning system is more of a, a, a pyramidal system where you have to look in multiple districts to actually figure out what uses are allowed. Uh, here it's just all in one place. Uh, and then density. Uh, 
we found ourselves replicating the same use districts over and over again just to get at different levels of density. So what we decided is just split it off and, and make it its own sort of module. So here you see the full spectrum of zoning. Uh, we also have the optional third module for overlays. Uh, we believe that uh, with this new system, we will there'll be a lot less reliance on overlay moving forward. I think what you may have seen over the last uh, few decades is every time we have a community plan update, they're usually a suite of overlays that come along with that work. And we're hoping now that we can handle most of it with the base zoning. Uh, and so one, one, uh, one other important thing to point out here is that our entire uh, zoning code structure is organized around these, uh, what we call the zoning district articles. And there you see articles two through six, uh, and we just went through the zone string. And then we have uh, what I like to consider, I think our team likes to think about it as uh, the sort of the operating system articles. Uh, so uh, the, uh, you know, the rest of the articles that kind of help you figure out what, how these zones work. Um, and so I think if you like to, if, if you think about uh, the operating system of articles one and then seven through 14, um, Article two through six are sort of like the apps that are working within it. Uh, so yeah, one of the big uh, picture things to keep in mind is uh, the zoning district articles uh, are organized into like at least uh, uh, three parts, uh, parts A, B, and C. Part A is a, a sort of introduction and it doesn't assume that someone uh, knows how to use the zoning code from the beginning. Uh, for a lot of you, uh, you you know, after a first few reads, you'll be able to skip right over article or part A of each of the articles. But this sort of gives uh, someone a, a sort of an orientation as to how the new zoning code, uh, or at least that particular article, is organized and how it how it relates to the other articles. Uh, then you have part B, which is actually the actual districts themselves. Uh, and there you'll see, uh, like in the right there with the low rise medium one. Um, it's more of a summarized set of zoning regulations uh, that tell you uh, what <clears throat> what the rules are for that particular district, so in this particular form district. Uh, and then part C will actually tell you what the rules are. So uh, there you see lot, uh, lot area is uh, NA in this, but if we did have a minimum, we would, it, the part C would tell you how we, you know, what is the lot area uh, regulation, what's the intent of it, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, I'll get into that a little bit more detail here where uh, the, like each of the, so take a step back. So the lot area is the rule. And then uh, the, it's part of the, 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 the form district here. So in this example here, like each, uh, each rule has its own structure as well. So like it's, it's, it's we're, me we're meaning for it to be a one-stop shop for you. So you won't necessarily have to worry about whether or not there's a rule somewhere else that might change what it is. So like for the most part, uh, this rule is what it is right here. So in each rule has an intent statement. It also, well, it starts with a definition uh, right underneath the section. And then it gives you an intent statement and then it'll, it'll establish uh, the applicability. So when does this rule apply? When do I need to look at it? Uh, and then the standards will give you any sort of uh, parameters uh, for, uh, you know, when, when somebody is subject to these rules, and then we it, it, we outline how uh, a particular uh, regulation is measured, uh, and if there are any exceptions, uh, we will also list them there. Uh, and then we also identify what forms of relief are available for that type of rule. And uh, this new uh, rigorous structure here, uh, it does allow for us to have what we what I showed in the part in the districts, right? Uh, these more summarized documents. So one important note is if we're going to regulate lot area, it's regulated the same way everywhere. If, it, if we're going to regulate a setback, it's right, like a type of setback. We're going to regulate it the same way anytime it's utilized. So you, there is a little more uh, predictability in there. Uh, and then we also pay, paid a lot of attention to making sure that there are um, relief mechanisms that are embedded into the program. Uh, I think they range from by right to discretionary, uh, and there's some that are kind of in the middle. So exceptions within the rules, uh, they're, they're, they'll either give you an outright exemption for specific scenarios, or it'll present uh, by right alternatives uh, that, are, that are also acceptable, uh, that are not necessarily uh, you know, subject to the, to the base rule. Um, then we also have uh, this thing called alternate typologies. 
And that's where it's a sort of a prepackaged set of exceptions for very specific scenarios. So uh, right now we have uh, the civic alternative typology being proposed for, uh, for downtown. And those are for like civic buildings, uh, like libraries, museums, concert halls. So we, we have like sort of this alternate typology that sort of floats above the zone. Um, and, it, and it's and eligibility for those are outlined for each of the alternate typologies. We also have, uh, and those will range from being by right to some form of discretionary action. So that's why it's kind of in the middle. So, you know, each alternate typology will set its own parameters for when, it, when you're able to use it and also what uh, a, a approval path there is for it. Uh, then there's a public benefit systems. Uh, and that's where we, uh, we put a lot of the programs that in, try to, are trying to incentivize what we consider to be a public benefit. Uh, and, and within it, we offer a series of bonuses. So additional development potential or waivers of uh, rules. So, <laughs> uh, so waivers of the regulation. So maybe there's scenarios where, you know, within affordable housing projects, certain aspects of your zoning won't apply to you. Uh, and then there's alternative compliance. Uh, alternative compliance is a discretionary process. It's a new thing. Uh, it's sort of our answer to the fact that most anything that needs to be creative has to have some form of a variance to be able to happen. Uh, so it's it has, um, it allows for more creative approaches uh, 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 to design. Uh, that also meet the intent of our regulation. I think it's also an acknowledgement that the way we write stuff in the code isn't necessarily the always way, is always the way that um, one could meet the intent that we, uh, that we have behind some of these regulations. Uh, so that is uh, a, 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 an important tool. So there, uh, it doesn't let you off the hook for what we need you to do, uh, but it does let you off the hook for um, what, uh, how you go about meeting that intent. It is a discretionary action. It's a, it's a uh, director level decision that is appealable to the APC, uh, but it, is, uh, it does not involve a hearing in that first level of review. Uh, so, you know, most projects that get through with just the director approval, uh, it's a fairly quick timeline. It's a lot more like what the CDOs are today, if you, if you wanna think about uh, process wise. And then we also have the adjustment and variances as options within it. Um, and then, so uh, just one other thing that uh, the new zone, the organized zoning structure allows is for more tailored uh, zoning summaries to be able to be provided. Uh, so here you see a zone string, a complete one, uh, not necessarily one that's proposed in downtown, but it's just this hypothetical zone string. Here you see that the form district, all the regulations that you have, you can look down, you get it down to just one page if you understand already what the regulations are. So you can get a quick summary of just the building potential. Uh, and then frontage, uh, which today would actually be something that's uh, addressed primarily through a series of overlays um, and uh, would require a lot of discretionary action. We've taken a lot of that uh, and have put it into more predictable standards that, uh, that it could be implemented on a by right basis. So, and it's also down to one page here, uh, something that would have been, again, several, several pages and multiple documents most likely. Uh, then we have the development standard district page, which uh, will tell you anything that's specific, any, any development standards that are specific to that part of the city. Otherwise, the rest of them apply, uh, you know, depending on the scenario. Uh, and, and here we have a, like a, a 12 page use district, uh, but it's all tabular, right? So it's a table format that's fairly easy to read. Uh, and we give you the, se the sections for where you can find out more, uh, where we don't give you like the, the outright. Uh, the, the, the summarized version of the regulation. And then the density district, which is really just one row within a sheet of, the, of, a, of, a, of, a, of this paper, of this, of this one page here. Um, so I, I think here, what you're seeing here is sort of like what we're actually gonna also be delivering, uh, which I don't know, hopefully I'm not gonna cannibalize Aaron's slides later, but uh, this is part of what we're trying to do with the, uh, the new uh, web code system where uh, you know, when you put in an address, uh, you'll be able to just pull a quick summary of what's possible on a, p on a piece of land. Uh, and then uh, you can then kind of grow the level of detail depending on what you're looking for after that. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Claire. 
Thanks, Eric. Uh, Claire Kelly with the Downtown Community Plan Team. And thank you so much to all of our attendees for joining us this afternoon. I'm going to give a high level overview of the Downtown Community Plan and then talk a little bit about how the Community Plan and the new Zoning Code interact to um, implement our policy vision in downtown. Next slide, please. The proposed update to, to the downtown community plan seeks to accommodate current as well as future needs uh, within our downtown community, providing for housing and job growth in a meaningful and equitable way. The community plan update process also acts as a tool to address community issues and opportunities that we hear about during the extensive community outreach process. The plan's policy document lays out this community vision and uses zoning, land use tools, as well as other implementation tools to implement the vision of the plan. The downtown community plan will be the first in the city to use the new zoning code. So what this really means is that as the downtown community plan moves through the adoption process, the new zoning code is moving alongside through the adoption process. And um, when the downtown community plan is adopted, the both the framework of the new zoning code as well as the specific zoning districts that are being applied within downtown will be adopted as well. As other community plans throughout the city are updated and adopted in the next several years, the new zoning code will then apply to those areas and new tools that will be developed for those parts of the city will be uh, adopted as part of the new zoning code as well. Next slide. Our community planning practice here in Los Angeles really focuses on four major issues that affect our city and our region today. These are climate change, access to housing, equity, and a shifting economy. Mobility, the public realm, and environmental justice are also key issues for an evolving downtown. These issues are, of course, intertwined, which underscores the importance of continually considering these issues in relation to one another throughout the planning process. And it's also important to keep in mind that these are the fundamental issues that both our plan document as well as our zoning tools seek to address. Next slide. The development of the community plan since 2014 has considered those factors on the previous slide as well as extensive public input to shape a vision for a thoughtful, equitable, and sustainable downtown of the future. In the future, downtown Los Angeles will be a place that ensures access to opportunity by concentrating a wide variety of uses near transit, offers a mix of housing for households at all income levels and sizes, is accessible, safe, and comfortable for all modes of travel, provides benefits to the community as growth continues, and celebrates and honors downtown's unique neighborhoods and history. Next slide. Since 2014, city planning has held workshops, focus groups, open houses, office hours, and presentations, and has collaborated with community-based organizations to solicit community input. We've engaged with nearly 3,500 members of the, of the downtown community at these events. Informational guides have been produced in languages spoken downtown, both digitally and in print. Some of the key engagement activities held in recent years include a week-long downtown open studio in October of 2016, our scoping meeting to kick off the environmental review process, numerous roundtable discussions with neighborhood council committees, workshops and focus groups in partnership with various community organizations, planning 101 presentations, as well as virtual open houses and a public hearing at the end of last year to collect public feedback. It's important to note that our engagement efforts have really been a collaborative effort between both the downtown community plan as well as the new zoning code to ensure comprehensive and integrated public input for both areas of the work. Next slide, please. 
So what have we heard over the years during all of this outreach? The major issues and themes that we've heard have mostly been consistent over time, really centering on the unique needs of downtown's various neighborhoods and districts, but aligned with the overall vision of improving livability alongside growth in households, jobs, and economic opportunity. Increased density near transit, the need for affordable housing, honoring and protecting downtown special places, mobility enhancements, regulatory improvements to streamline development, expanding public open space and promoting a healthier environment have really been the resounding themes that we've heard during our outreach process. In our work over the years, we have found that the adopted Central City and Central City North community plans, which together comprise the area covered by the downtown community plan, are not producing enough affordable housing, um, it, mainly because the current incentive program most widely used within downtown, the Transfer Floor Area Rights Program, uh, does not prioritize or elevate affordable housing within um, its structure. The current plans on the books are really oriented around predominantly commercial and industrial environments with minimal mixed use and pedestrian oriented uh, zoning tools. Thus, we have pursued the development of new zoning tools that really center again, the desire for more affordable housing, more accessible neighborhoods, um, as well as opportunities for jobs and access to services and amenities. A key objective, oh, sorry, previous slide. A key objective of the community plan is to accommodate projected growth. Each of our community plans plays a role in helping the city meet our targeted housing and employment uh, growth projections. The Southern California Association of Governments, which is our local planning authority, has projected that by the year 2040, downtown will have 125,000 new residents, which uh, is about a tripling of the current residential population, as well as 70,000 new housing units and about 55,000 new employees. The plan is proposing capacity for even more population housing units and jobs than the SCAG projections, recognizing that downtown sits at the heart of our transit system and offers access to opportunity, both in terms of employment, educational and cultural resources, as well as a diversity of housing types. And 80% of the plan capacity is within a half mile of major transit stops. Again, really reinforcing the goal of this plan to concentrate growth near transit resources. Next slide. The plan promotes bold growth and refines the system that links development and public benefits. A key feature of the plan is restructuring land use regulations to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, expand the inventory of affordable housing, and ensure job opportunities for varying employment and experience levels. In certain neighborhoods, the existing land use and zoning regulations have discouraged development, particularly as a result of expensive and multi-year review processes. Stakeholders throughout our update process have identified a number of existing regulatory barriers, and this plan really seeks to address these regulatory barriers to streamline and incentivize development that will help the city meet our policy objectives um, and ease the process for projects that comply with the rules. You can see here a few examples of many of the barriers that the plan proposes to remove for projects in the downtown area, including removing parking minimums, removing lot area based density limitations in portions of downtown such as Chinatown, where they are currently applied, restructuring open space requirements and offering uh, additional incentives for 100% affordable housing projects. Finally, projects that choose to participate in the community benefits program will also benefit from increased site plan review thresholds, uh, which are proposed to be raised from 
50 units or 50,000 square feet of commercial development to 500 units, 500,000 square feet of commercial development or projects that exceed 500 feet in height. Again, really recognizing that we want to streamline the process for projects that offer community benefits and uh, really comply with the proposed vision for downtown. Next slide. Thank you. So the community plan includes several components, including the policy document, which again lays out the vision for downtown over the next several decades. The plan map, which establishes the land use for the downtown plan area, including uh, the range of uses that are permitted as well as the range of intensities. The zoning map, which is the primary implementation tool for the community plan. And then finally, the implementation overlay, which is how we implement the proposed community benefits program in the downtown plan area. Next slide, please. So finally, I'll now just walk through a quick example that demonstrates the relationship between the plan's policy vision and the new zoning code, showing how we are using new zoning tools to help uh, implement the plan's policy vision. So as you can see here, this is an example of a goal from our community plan document, as well as a policy. And this language here is really about uh, prioritizing a pedestrian friendly environment and ensuring that the built environment helps to improve access and connectivity in downtown. Next slide, please. In this instance, the form district is the zoning tool that is being used to help to implement the policy vision that you just saw in the previous slide. So here we're focusing on the building break requirement, which is one of the regulations contained within the form district. Uh, building break requirements are proposed to help ensure that large blocks are broken up and that projects that take up a full block help to support a pedestrian friendly environment, as well as providing new opportunities for landscaping and shade. So here you can see an example of how very specific regulations found within the proposed zoning tools can help us to achieve our broader policy vision. And now I'll turn it back over to Erin to speak a little bit more about the code. Thanks, Claire. This is Erin Coleman with City Planning. Um, in this portion of the presentation, I'll walk you through a brief overview of some big changes to the code that you might not be aware of yet uh, before we get into our roundtable discussion. Next slide, please. So one guiding principle in our update of the new code has been to create more predictability through the use of objective standards. And a key example of this is in the community benefit system in which an applicant can obtain bonus floor area or height by right through the provision of community benefits, such as affordable housing, access to public open space, and other priorities established in the CPIO or a specific plan. And here you can see an example of a form district that differentiates between the allowable base floor area ratio, which is what an applicant is allowed without providing community benefits, and the bonus floor area ratio, which may only be achieved through providing community benefits. Next slide, please. As Claire mentioned, um, the, the new code allows for increased an increased threshold for when discretionary review is required. In the current code, this is known as site plan review. And in the new code, this is known as project review. Um, so downtown is applying a project review threshold for projects participating in the community benefits program. And this new threshold for review kicks in only once a project reaches 500,000 square feet of non-residential floor area, 500 feet in height or 500 dwelling units. And uh, this is in comparison to 50,000 square feet of non-residential floor area or 50 dwelling units from today's site plan review threshold. Um, and note that in the new code, projects that are not participating in the community benefits program still need to comply with that lower threshold. And additionally, the project review thresholds can be modulated by the development standards district, which is the third component of the zone string that Eric walked us all through earlier. Um, so this is to fit the um, unique context of different communities as appropriate. 
Next slide, please. Uh, as Claire also mentioned, there's no minimum parking required downtown, and uh, this is a standard that also is modulated by the development standards districts. So development standards districts can require uh, a range of parking uh, from either no minimum parking to an equivalent of what is required today. Next slide, please. Um, so in today's code, uh, spaces are either really considered indoor or outdoor. If if a space is um covered it's considered indoor um and we don't really allow for a hybrid uh in in an effective way and as we know in, in la's climate you really do need more hybrid spaces that are indoor and outdoor so the new code takes a fresh look at what it means to be outdoor and allows for outdoor space to be covered if a minimum height clearance is met um, and if the space is unenclosed. And we have clear rules for, for what that means to be unenclosed. Um, and something else that's pretty um, exciting is that we have new rules that allow for spaces that are covered but unenclosed to be exempt from floor area. So that's a, a pretty big change that we're excited about. Next slide, please. Um, in the new code, trees are calculated, the tree requirement is calculated based on floor area instead of dwelling units. Um, this removes a key barrier to micro units and requires trees equally across the board for all types of uses. Next slide, please. The new code introduces standards to minimize the visibility of ground mounted equipment, such as transformers, from the public realm. The standards prioritize first locating the equipment underground. Secondly, in a building or a structure. Um, and last, the equipment could be screened, but located outside of the front and side yard. Next slide, please. I've saved the big one for last. So we have um, an update to the adaptive reuse programs in the new code, um, both for the citywide and downtown programs. So um, first, there are many shared uh, similarities in the updates. So, um, the big one is that the eligibility requirements are updated from uh, uh, originating at a fixed date of July 1st, 1974 to instead having a rolling date, um, capturing any building that's at least 25 years old. And buildings that are at least 10 years old um, are also eligible th through a CUP process. Um, so this helps to ensure that the supply of eligible buildings are added to on an ongoing basis. Um, other notable changes include allowing for the conversion um, to any use that's permitted in the applied use district. Um, it's currently only the conversion from commercial to residential uses is allowed. Um, the floor area incentives also have seen an update. So notably a 50,000 square foot exemption for historic buildings uh, that are part of a unified development is proposed. Projects are also granted one additional story which is exempt from floor area and height restrictions. And projects are also exempted from having to comply with some form and frontage district requirements. For downtown, uh, the, a key change is that um, the program is expanded to all of downtown and parking structures are also eligible if they're at least 10 years old. Citywide, um, there are some unique features. One is that um, the program is going to be allowed by right. Um, uh, if there's an affordable housing component included. Um, the linkage fee will be waived if there are 10 or more restricted affordable housing units provided. Um, and similar to downtown, parking structures will be eligible uh, with the stipulation that they must be at least 10 years uh, of age. And um, that it's really only for those areas where parking um, has exceeded the minimum amount required where they are eligible. Um, and just as a note, when, when I say citywide in this context, it's it really is only um, about where the new code is applied. So it's not really across the whole city, it's just as the code is applied, these standards also apply. Um, so that's a really quick overview of some exciting changes in the new code. Uh, there are certainly many more, but we want to bring these to your attention. Uh, next slide, please. Sorry, if you were talking to me, I I'm having some internet connectivity issues here. That's okay. Um, just next slide if, if you're able to. Working on it. Thanks. <laughs> okay. um, so now I'll, I'll walk you through a quick overview on next steps before we begin our roundtable discussion. Next slide.
so sorry. That's okay. Um, so it's important to understand that the new code will be applied through the community plan program. Uh, and that the existing code will continue to apply in areas that have not yet been rezoned with the new code. There have already been some completed deliverables with the new code. First, the new R1 variation zones, which were developed by the new code project team, uh, but added into the current code, became effective in March of 2017. These will be carried into the new code structure as they are applied through the community plan update process. Uh, secondly, Article 13, the administration article of the new code was adopted by City Council just in June of this year through the processes and procedures ordinance. Um, and then we are currently uh, in the adoption process for the new zoning districts, tools and provisions needed for the downtown community plan. Um, so alongside the downtown community planning team, we have our second city planning commission date coming up on August 26th. Um, after that, the uh, Boyle Heights team uh, will be carrying forward uh, the new zoning that they need for their community plan area, um, and they'll be releasing their draft EIR in the fall. And finally, finally, additional zoning districts and tools will continue to be rolled out with future community plan updates. Next slide, please. So how do you get engaged at this point? So there's short-term strategies and long-term strategies. So uh, in a short term, we have some upcoming office hours. Uh, where we invite you to uh, test the code and, and bring your questions to these office hour sessions. So the dates are here um, coming up on Monday, August 16th, uh, Wednesday, August 18th, and Thursday, August 19th. Um, the, these are in advance of our city planning commission date on August 26th. Um, and then in the long term, you know, we, there's opportunity for continuing engagement through the community plan update process as the new code is rolled out. Um, and we are certainly also open to future testing the code sessions um, and really look to the architectural community for your expertise. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we have some resources here and I can drop these links into the chat as well. Uh, Will, I think already dropped the link to the um, new zoning code earlier, but I'll, I'll drop it again. Um, and then we also have an interactive map of the proposed zoning for downtown. Um, and it's a it's a great map. You can click on different parcels and see that quick kind of zone summary that Eric provided that the layout of. Um, and um, then we also have some prepackaged zones for testing the code with some sample sites already put together in um, a combined PDF for you as well. Um, so I'll go ahead and and share these links. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Michelle to uh, start the roundtable discussion. Great. Well, thank you, Aaron, Eric, and Claire for that excellent presentation. Um, and really, one of our objectives today is to continue the conversation about the zoning code as it evolves. Um, and we want to make sure that everyone here today comes away with a better understanding of the structure, um, where you can find the district form and use regulations, and the policy intent behind the standards. Uh, so during this panel discussion, um, just a you know, kind of a little bit of how this is going to work. It's it's going to function sort of like a fishbowl. We'll have a panel. Um, we're going to take a deeper dive into some of the key design priorities and considerations. Um, and we'd like for this to be a roundtable dialogue uh, where we hear from both design professionals and planners in the room. Um, and so with that in mind, uh, we're going to take a closer look at the code approaches and how we can continue to work together with AIA. Um, and just once more, um, just to reintroduce our panelists, we've got Nathan Bishop, uh, principal with Koenig Eisenberg, Hava Danielson, principal with DSH Architecture, Sarah Lorenzen uh, with Tolo Architecture, um, also professor at Cal Poly Pomona, um, Tracy Stone, Kelly Van Odegem, and our city planners, Aaron, Eric, and Claire. Um, and so with that, um, I think the panelists can just go ahead and, you know, unmute themselves and we can get started. So the first question is, um, you know, we know that a major catalyst for the rewrite of the Los Angeles Zoning Code was our out of date 
code that was last com comprehensively updated in 1946. And um, this update was started eight years ago. So, you know, there's definitely, you know, a, a lot of work as, as Eric shared um, all the groundwork that was involved in getting this started. Um, and, you know, I'd like to ask the panelists, how do we ensure that the code is nimble enough to address changing market forces, um, emerging demands, um, you know, are imperative for climate adapted design and changes in building technology? How do we um, develop a code that um, is flexible and stands the, withstands the test of time? Well, I'll, I'll jump in, I guess. Go ahead. <laughs> um, well, it, it seems to me that, uh, you know, you, you want to allow, obviously, for, um, for new technologies, for example, uh, to, to be used without needing to revise the code, hopefully. And so one of the areas that jumped out to me uh, was the character frontage districts where you're specifying a list of materials and they're very specific. And you're also talking about minimum glazing percentages. And in both of those cases, I, I guess I would recommend or, or suggest that perhaps the code is written to um, limit things you don't want instead of prescribing things that you think you do want. And uh, by leaving out certain certain elements, you allow for new materials to be adopted and, and to be used as they come along as one example. So that, that seemed like one way that the code could um, allow for changes without needing to be rewritten. Um, I have a, a, I think a constructive suggestion. Um, one of my concerns is the miles and miles of what I'm calling substandard uh, sidewalks right in Los Angeles. So if we have maps of purple streets for the hillside districts, I think we could equally have maps of purple sidewalks in this city. And, you know, one of the things we've really seen with uh, in the last year and a half is just how excited people are to occupy the sidewalk, to sit on the sidewalk in restaurants, to sit at the sidewalk in, in meetings. Um, another thing that has come up in the last few years that is going to be increasingly more important as, as a response to climate change is uh, bioswales, bioremediation in the sidewalks. And so our sidewalks need to get bigger, they need to be generous, and they need to be inviting and shaded. And my concern is with um, I think there's an underlying philosophy to a lot of the frontage districts, the shop front districts, specifically the market dis front, you know, frontage districts specifically, um, uh, pushing toward a strong street wall, right? And that strong street wall combined with the undersized sidewalks is pushing us away from these things that we're, we as a city, are moving toward. And, and I would like to see that be a place uh, that gets opened up. And so my constructive suggestion is, you know, can the front, can the application of frontage districts, uh, first of all, be a little bit less prescriptive, a little bit less strict, as, as Tracy said, but also can that move into community planning so that the place where people really understand their boulevards and their streets and where the problems are and where the opportunities are, that the application of these things start to get a, a finer grain, right? And, and, and where there are opportunities for people to really occupy their sidewalks um, and, and, and increase the depth Right, which means not have as strict a build to depth um, that, that 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 can already be built into it in its first implementation. Yeah, I, I, what I'm hearing from um, both of you is um, to Michelle's question about being nimble and, and creative. Um, well, first, I want to thank Eric and thank Claire and thank Aaron. Uh, for putting together this presentation. I know it was a really, 
<laughs> you guys have been working on this for a long time and it's really hard to distill down, but thank you. And we just kind of skimmed the code today. I know we can spend all day and I'll probably spend the rest of my career trying to get a handle on it. But um, my question, you know, my, I guess my suggestion or question centers around um, how do we support creativity and experimentation? And um, if I look at that, I know you're having um, some connection issues, Eric, but you had a diagram um, that maybe you could pull up that had a, a range from by right to discretionary. And uh, it seems to me that right now, um, the most creative potential projects have the most steps to encounter in a discretionary process. And so I, I you know, I, it, it's a, it's really difficult, yeah, with the alternative compliance potentially to convince clients that we need to take more steps. So I, I was hoping you could just clarify, Eric, since we're here to understand how things work, uh, what the process is for alternative compliance. And, and I guess what I'm getting to, if it's too many steps, is there a way to move it <laughs> so that more creative projects are more encouraged rather than penalized? Yeah, so um, the, the, the steps are fair, fairly straightforward, but uh, fairly treacherous, depending on what part of the city uh, a project is in. Uh, it's an application that gets submitted uh, to, to our, uh, for our director of planning mm -hmm. uh, to act upon. Really, that's our, 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 our project planning teams yeah. uh, reviewing. Uh, there's some uh, very basic finding, uh, uh, very basic finding around, uh, you know, that the proposal meets the intent of what the regulation is in terms of what they're seeking for alternative compliance from. Okay. Uh, and again, that does require some discretion. So like on the, on the uh, department's part. So it's not something that we could do necessarily by right. Uh, but uh, I think the, 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 the hardest uh, pill to swallow for that program is that it's appealable, right? That's what I was going to ask. Yeah. yeah. So on that, on that front, I mean, there's not much we can do other than pro maybe providing additional guidance on, uh, you know, past projects that have been approved. But I think more importantly, um, you know, those, sh you know, if there are alternative strategies that are approved regularly, uh, you know, figuring out a way to put those into back on the other end of the spectrum here uh, mm -hmm. in the by right section as an exception, as a, a sort of a by right alternative um, for that particular type of rule. Uh, mm -hmm. An example will be in our uh, sort of our blank wall regulations where, um, you know, the distance between uh, the windows uh, where we're allowing uh, for other forms of treatments uh, that also generally meet the, the uh, intent of the regulation. Yeah. Uh, so uh, a little less straightforward, uh, but uh, you know what we could do is uh, in advance or as you know within the next few years as we're rolling out the code, uh, add more to these buy right alternatives mm -hmm. that are already baked into the code. It's uh, and we're really look into your 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 profession. Yeah, I, yeah. Thank you. Um, I mean, it strikes me actually as you're talking that um, I wonder whether or not there's incentives that could be built in for creativity. Um, well, sorry, Tracy, it looks like you were gonna say something. Oh, I, I was just gonna note that um, in looking at the alternative compliance path, I, I see that it's got the sort of standard language of you have to act within 75 days of deeming the, the project complete. And um, as you know, we all know that time is money and this is an area that often projects get hung up in and we see the planning department take maybe a little advantage of it, perhaps maybe to work with your schedule, but um, we can see projects go for a year and a half before being deemed complete so that that timeline doesn't have to kick in. And uh, one way I think to be more nimble or to offer incentives is to look at how that, that timeline can be compressed. Mm. Yeah, and I, these are, I I yeah, these are excellent oh. uh, comments. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut anyone off. No, go ahead, Michelle. Oh, no, please go ahead. I'll I'll go after you. I, I just wanted to build a little bit on on what Nathan uh, and Tracy um, uh, were were bringing up about the frontage district, um, which is they seem not not just in you know 
uh, very uh, prescriptive and specific, um, well be beyond, I think, what we're accustomed to seeing in terms of, of a zoning envelope. Um, but, you know, to the level of detail that there's a line in the character frontage about the symmetrical arrangement of the muntins and mullions on the windows. Um, and, you know, again, getting into details on the, the, the material palette that's available and the amount of transparency. And I, and my question is really like, where are these guidelines uh, coming from? Because they do seem to be a, a bit more historicist and looking backward um, in their sort of approach. Uh, and, you know, as a, as a rule, Los Angeles has always been a place of experimentation and looking to the future. Uh, so it feels a little out of place um, to me um, as a, you know, an Angelino for the last couple of decades. It, uh, it is a little out of place, uh, mainly because it is a tool, uh, a tool that we would have rolled out as part of like an overlay in the past. Uh, and it is, uh, it is very much uh, being driven by his, by a, a form of uh, a historic preservation, like our infill standards that we have for non-contributing buildings. Mm -hmm. So it is being guided by the historic preservation end of our policy objectives. Uh, so these are these are not uh, intended to be, and uh, I think the group that we have uh, working on is, you know, we understand that that is a very uh, uh, intense tool uh, to utilize. So I think what we're advising is a more limited utilization of these character frontages, and that's probably why you see in uh, in Article uh, Three right now the frontages article uh, that they're essentially right now they're sequestered as their own part. Uh, I, I alluded to it earlier that, you know, most of the zoning district articles are parts A, B, and C. Part three with the frontages, those character rules are sequestered into like a part D because uh, they are a fairly intense uh, form of regulation uh, and only intended to be utilized in areas where there's, sort, there's a historic fabric that's, you know, they're seeking to maintain. But I think, uh, Aaron, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about some of the flexibility that we built because we did roll out something similar. Well, uh, Eric, I, I'm going to get to that's actually one of the questions. Um, so perfect. it's actually a great seg perfect segue because, um, you know, speaking of, you know, um, context, you know, one of the, the greatest challenges in writing a new zoning code for a changing downtown is making sure that new design approaches harmonize with the existing building fabric. Um, and I know that the um, both the downtown and the zip team have really tried to do this. Um, it's it's very challenging. Um, we I think at the end of the day we want we do want to see creativity in the buy right model. I, I think that's the ultimate goal is to really um, you know set some basic parameters and and really see what the design community can come up with and. At the end of the day, you know, nothing is set in stone. So this is, um, we may not get it perfectly right. Um, we, we won't really know until we start seeing projects. And this is why, um, you know, we, we really are so fortunate uh, to be having this conversation and um, working with the AIA, getting feedback from our PVP program as well. Um, that's really been, a very instructive process. So, you know, I think the idea is to not so much to um, create historic building standards and lock downtown in, in the past, but rather to apply these frontage districts, as Eric was saying, in very limited circumstances. So that's something we can um, maybe touch on a little bit in, in this next part. But um, in terms of, you know, ways that site design and um, and new buildings downtown can be responsive uh, to their site and surrounding context. What are some ways that we can kind of give designers some parameters um, and also thinking about Los Angeles citywide, right? I mean, you everybody has seen our boulevards. Um, so when we talk about a new zoning code, we're also talking about creating livable boulevards around the city. Um, downtown is the first one out of the chute. But, um, you know, just think about some of the, the really kind of um, unfortunate architecture that we've seen spring up from by right projects. Um, 
and um, I know I'm I'm preaching to the choir here, but what when you're when you're working with um, an existing context, um, be it historic or maybe it's a um, a mix of eclectic styles, how what is the best way to give designers room to push the boundaries and also um, really set some minimum parameters to elevate the quality of design? If I could jump in here, Michelle, thank you. Yeah, please. Uh, so I think I think this discussion about, about frontages and, and allowing flexibility while also looking to um, you know, ensure that we're meeting some of our, our policy goals is so interesting. And um, to kind of talk about two examples, you know, I think first the, the character frontages, as was mentioned earlier, are a really specific tool that has been developed to help us to address some of our historic districts uh, throughout the city. So in the case of downtown, we're applying this tool in a, in a limited way, really just in the arts district and the historic core. And the development of the tool as well as the application was guided by uh, extensive feedback that we've heard from the community, including um, our historic preservation experts here in Los Angeles, as well as uh, historic surveys like Historic Survey, uh, that, like uh, Survey LA that have helped us to identify where there are you know, really meaningful collections of historic buildings um, within our city. On, on the other hand, looking at something like the conversation around sidewalk widths and, and improving pedestrian accessibility, which I think is, I would agree, so so crucial and, and really key to working towards the downtown that I think we all wanna see as a, as a walkable, comfortable, really humane place. Um, you know, I think this is a great example of how the frontage tools were developed with the very specific context of downtown in mind. So when you look at, at uh, the regulatory context of downtown, we have wonderful street standards that were developed specifically for downtown streets several years ago that actually um, ensure that we have wide sidewalks uh, partially through required easements on many streets in downtown um, that help to ensure, again, that pedestrian access. So with that in mind, we developed the frontage tools that have been proposed for a lot of downtown, really with the idea that we would be pairing these generous sidewalks that are required through the street standards with the street wall tool, again, to um, help ensure, you know, really human comfort um, along downtown sidewalks. Additionally, the frontage districts include this provision that I think is really great that allows for a certain percentage of the build to requirement to be broken with pedestrian oriented amenity spaces, meaning that a plaza or outdoor dining or another type of open space is allowed to count as, um, as build to towards meeting that requirement. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, really acknowledging exactly what you were saying earlier, Kelly, about um, the, the increasing importance of um, creating comfortable shaded spaces for, for pedestrians in, in downtown. I should have had that, but, um, <laughs> but I agree with her wholeheartedly. Um, and I, I will say, I, I just a side tangent, um, I, BOE uh, and the 2035 Mobility Plan have done a lot to sort of move us more towards more sidewalks and more pedestrian friendly um, boulevards than, um, you know, which is great. So, um, but the, the specificity in the frontage guidelines does get very nitty gritty and very detailed. Um, and, you know, frankly, like there's going to be, I, I predict, um, some uh, conflicts with, you know, Western and Southern facing facades, especially the upper level um, glass requirements, where there's going to be, you know, it's going to be a bit of a, a push. Um, so I, I would just encourage you, I, and I'm, I'm hearing from Eric that there may be sort of a, an AMMR um, a zoning process where creative solutions get um, put together through that alternative methodology uh, pathway, for lack of a better term, 
and added to the modular uh, sort of format of the code. So I, I hope that's the intent. I may be speculating wildly off the reservation there. No, that's not a wild speculation. Um, I think I wanted to point out, like, let's see here, maybe I can share my screen again at the risk of losing <laughs> losing connection. Uh, but uh, here's uh, here's some examples of like what we're uh, in the transparency section. Uh, we're allowing for like inactive wall treatment alternatives that are already built into the code. So you're putting in trees uh, where the uh, blank wall would be. Um, oh, geez. But, but Eric, I have to say, I it, that all makes perfect sense. But I, I in looking at the frontage uh, guidelines, I didn't understand why the code is so concerned about the amount of transparency above a certain level. It seems like it, it's wonderful the attention that's being paid to the pedestrian experience, which is absolutely appropriate, I think. But I don't understand why or, or how being a, the transparency up above is related to being a good neighbor or a good building in the context of, of downtown. It seems like those should begin to be regulated by other things like energy uh, orientation uh, it, the building code on residential light and, and air and things like that. I, I just didn't understand what it was doing in the zoning code exactly. Yeah, um, I believe, um, I mean, there there is some discussion around that. I think, uh, at least on the ground story, I think, are, are we on the same page as the ground story is, uh, is the right place to... Yeah, ground and maybe the first three or something. But when you get above that, yeah. How is that um, important? I think these are generally calibrated to like what the expected norm might be. Uh, I think it's up for discussion as to whether we need to um, have a conversation around it. I think uh, uh, we try to keep those upper uh, story tra transparencies about as low as possible, if they're even there at all. Uh, so, you know, like I, 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 I guess I, I've mentioned it to the to in, in past conversations, but not in this one. The all of these regulations here are, uh, are like, uh, you know, applicable stories built to depth, uh, ground story transparency, upper story. These are all uh, this, this helps if you think about them as if as if they have uh, switches and knobs uh, so that they get switched on and off as needed because they do uh, uh, address various aspects. Uh, that are kind of being driven by a lot of our policy objectives. Uh, and, you know, they just as they can be switched on or off, uh, they can also be dialed up and down. So these percentages can be calibrated based on what the expectation might be. They could be, we could either have no upper story transparency requirement, uh, or we can have some, but it could be minimal. Uh, so I think it, that's part of uh, what I want to make sure is understood by this group that uh, you know, these are by no means all of the districts you'll ever see. And we do have several uh, frontages that, that we have that don't have the level of detail that I think uh, character frontage does as well. Um, so you know, the shot front frontage here um, is another example. Uh, and I, want to, I just wanna make sure that that's clear. Like these are now currently being calibrated to what we believe is the policy objective. Uh, and if there's a, let's say our decision makers uh, decide otherwise that, you know, that the percentages are too high or that we shouldn't have them at all, these are things that can be uh, uh, modified moving forward. I so, just wanted to bring up again, um, I, I know we talked about this a few days ago, but not maybe in this audience, um, which was the, this, as, as you're going from a primarily written code to a primarily visual code, mm -hmm. the visuals uh, that you send out uh, are basically what's what's giving people, what's telling the story of what the planning uh, department and the city's uh, intent is. And in the graphics that have been developed, uh, there's there's a lot of clarity there, which I think is incredibly helpful. And I think, it, there is something really great about having a visual code and the way that everything's sort of on one page and how clear it is. But the, the language that's being, that's associated with this, which is very historicist and sort of pegged to a particular period of history, you know, from the twenties through the, you know, the forties, let's say, it's a very, very narrow um, part of history that is being represented here in everything that you're drawing. So even though we were talking about that there's an appearance of neutrality, these are so loaded 
with the given the imagery that I think that it's that there's also a little bit of a problem in that people who are not only owners but designers that there's there's a kind of a expectation or that there's the problem that the people are going to see this as this is the way to get something approved mm -hmm. if it looks like this and given uh, sort of where we are today and the kind of vitality of Los Angeles and nobody wants to live in a kind of uh, fake kind of world right that sort of that doesn't refer to the period that you're in you can be contextual without necessarily being historicist yeah but I that that language is important to acknowledge. And I, I really think it needs to be addressed because I think it's really- yeah, I agree with you, Sarah. I was, uh, Michelle, when you were talking about a, a place and context and and kind of uh, suggesting a, a continuity, it, it reminded me that there are plenty of places in and around and near downtown and the rest of LA that number one, they're not, they're not even a neighborhood of any sorts yet, you know, they may have a kind of building that um, doesn't make sense to refer to as a place is in transition to become more, um, you know, uh, humanely occupied in some way. And, and it also strikes me that, um, yeah, LA is a, I mean, the reason I came here is because it's such a great place of diversity and variety of experience. And so what, what strikes me and what Sarah's talking about is that it struck me that, you know, this is a lot of a conversation about how we live now and how we will live in the future. And if there's, there's not enough room uh, in how the code's written to let that happen, and it does end up looking like this, then it, if every building did this, it would be a place that kind of seem to, and even though there's room and knobs, Eric, I, I wonder, I think you're hearing from us that really wonder that um, it's got enough to to let that diversity and difference um, come through in the building. Not, not just let it, but encourage it. Okay. Right? Encourage it, yeah, you, thank you, you're, Kelly. Pre-programming the, <laughs> the, the default settings or you're putting it on the glide path to default settings that you may not be happy with. Yeah. And, you know, something a, that, uh, oh, I was just going to say that, you know, um, in having this, this dialogue, which is really great, I'm just thinking about kind of an alternative um, situation where, you know, you have one block with, um, you know, five parcels and, and three out of the five are doing their own thing and they have total freedom and creativity and what, you know, as as time goes on, you know, I, I think this is our challenge, right, to allow for some background buildings and and create some sort of um, rhythm and regularity. That that was really the challenge here is to, you know, allow for um, a, a diversion from the you know from the norm, but not to you know not to go back to what we have today, which is kind of a, you know, you can build anything within the zoning envelope, which is basically a box. So I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm really interested to hear everyone's thoughts about, you know, how do you, how do you balance that, right? When you, you want to um, make room for the really spectacular architecture that is really um, creative and, um, and really taking advantage of three, 360 degree design, but you're also trying to plan for um, just, you know, to be completely frank, you know, the kind of the worst case scenario where there's there's um, a lack of guidance. So I think- I, Yeah, I, I, I think you're that so balance. afraid of the worst case that it's, it's limiting the best. Right. But I, I also want to say something that would, might give you a little bit about what's happening in our profession, right? That I think is really important to present here. Uh, no, and I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I, I, I do feel that way often that I sympathize, you know, having been on these urban design review things, I do sympathize with the urban design studio, absolutely. And then I completely agree with Nathan. The problem is what happens, you know, what, what about us? What about, you know, the people you're trying to encourage? But, but here's another thing that I really want to, talk about, which is 
this is pushing us to a series of maybe admirable models of the, from the 20th century. And here's what's happening in our profession, right? That we're dealing with the effect of buildings on climate change. And we are in the middle of, you know, trying to move closer to Europe, inventing entirely new ways of making facades. And so the problem with these highly specific um, arrangements of the way facades were made in the 20th century is this really not recognizing where we are and by the time this gets published, hopefully where we will be. Okay, so facades. Two is storefronts, right? Retail, little shop fronts were in crisis before the pandemic. Now all bets are off. So we don't know what the best use of that ground floor is, right? Yeah. Yeah, and and we need to work with our clients. We need to work with our creative architects and good developers need to come up, be able to come up with some new models for activating the public realm because little shop fronts ain't going to do it, right? It really isn't. We need space for outdoor dining. We need space to give back at least and, and maybe some new things that we don't know about today. And And finally, I think... You know, one of the things about, I, I think I mentioned this at an earlier thing, and, and, and I'm sure you've heard it before, is the very specific, uh, the character frontage and the LA River uh, frontage, where you refer to emulating the models of the late 19th and early 20th century, which was not a great moment for, I'm an Angelino, and this was not a great moment in our history. And um, I know there's some really nice old buildings, but I think we can do better. I think every architect on this round table will look at each other and say, we can do better. And without stepping on the toes of the things people like about those buildings, I think we can all do better. We're, we're a much more sophisticated city than we were a hundred years ago. And the idea that that's even being referenced as, a, as something to work up to is, is, is just a little difficult. So, so these are the things where we see the future going and um, it feels like we wanna work with you to help us make those innovations and those moments really work for everybody, right? And so Hava, can I ask a, a follow-up to that? So what, you know, knowing how important um, predictability is, and, you know, I, I hear Nathan's comment about really kind of looking more towards the, you know, giving, um, creating pathways for innovation. So how, how can we support that? Um, how do we support that and also be um, fair in our application of what's, you know, creative and successful and creative, but not so successful. As planners, you know, we, we have to use our judgment and um, we like rules and <laughs> parameters. You know, so. that's the hardest part of it, Michelle. I mean, it's really the hardest part of it because we're, we're both, I think all of us are interested in setting up relationships between the public realm and buildings. And it's those relationships of how we want to maybe make room for more ways that buildings can relate to the public realm, that it, um, it's the, the translating that into math becomes really hard because if we have the goal of uh, a, a specific relationship that you're trying to encourage, then there can be variety and diversity. It's when it turns into an equation and proportion that it uh, gets harder and harder to see how we might be able to address things that we don't know what we're gonna address yet within such a prescriptive envelope. Yeah. I mean, we, we do understand yeah. that if the objectives are, right, I wanna have a lively street, I want there to be kind of active yes. people on the sidewalk and the ground floors are somehow um, lively spaces that that's the objective. The question is always what will get you there, right? And having, and I guess mm -hmm. that's, we're all sympathize with the fact that you're trying to get to that objective. And I think most people would agree with the objective. And I don't think, we, I don't even disagree that there should be 
what are quote unquote called background buildings, things which are quiet and not everything needs to be showy. But I don't think there's a disagreement there. It's the it's the it's that this percentage of window wall with this kind of sill and this kind of broken, you know, this this sort of, you know, that the window opens horizontally instead of vertically, that that will necessarily get that result. Yeah. And yeah. that's, I think, where we're, like, we understand the objectives, and I think a lot of people agree with the objectives, but it's the, it's the prescription of what will get you to there. That's seems yeah, it's almost like we need guardrails as opposed to the recipe or something, you know, kind of, you can work <laughs> at this range, but it yeah. doesn't have to be this. <laughs> we, that's and actually- Building well, something, we, oh, go ahead, Eric, sorry. It's, it's actually what I think we're trying to do is the guardrails. <laughs> uh, and that's where I think we, we want, we, we appreciate the feedback. Um, you know, we don't want the projects to go too far one way or the other. Um, and I think that's where uh, uh, one of the objectives behind the uh, code is also to try to, you know, not rely as much on overlays and discretionary review. Uh, which, you know, a lot, you know, having more design flexibility usually translates to more guidelines uh, and like, and, but that requires discretion. So that ends up, ends up adding to your uh, timeline. So I think it's sort of like a double-edged sword, right? Uh, we have to provide some specificity in order for something to be objective and a by right thing. Uh, but it's also like a benefit as well in that, like, let's say there are some new, uh, approaches that uh, that are coming out of Europe that we'd like to see in Los Angeles. If these standards are built into the code, we can amend uh, our code and it could go live uh, mm -hmm. like as soon as they're as soon as they go into effect uh, to like a lot of the city, depending on how the rules are being utilized. Uh, yeah. And I think we've heard in the past, and I think I want to make sure, Aaron, uh, that we talk about a little bit, you know, you know, in these these kind of precursor conversations we've had we've gotten some great feedback in it i think we're we're looking to see how we can respond right Aaron? i mean one of the one of the ways it occurs to me with the interest um you know to support more affordable housing we do a fair amount of affordable housing and it's it's really hard to pack a whole ground floor full of these kind of like vibrant active uses and models for how to live on a street yeah, you know, it's something that occurs to us quite a bit, and it's tough to do. So on, on that one, on that topic, I'll jump in really quickly, because uh, I think I want to I want to kind of go back to that modular zoning approach that I, that I mm -hmm. talked about, because like the, the, the built environment is one part of the conversation. So like there are characteristics of the buildings that people expect in this neighborhood, and those are actually independent of what uses can go into it. So it's a little more flexibility mm -hmm. that we built into there the code but so Aaron go ahead oh um I guess just um kind of looping back to a previous thread in the conversation about the images I think it's a great point you know in that um the character frontage uh graphics actually don't represent the full amount of flexibility um that the standards mm -hmm. allow for um so we we actually mm -hmm. you know have incorporated a lot of uh feedback uh, from the architectural community um, into the frontage rules um, for character frontages. Um, for instance, we allow for the vertical and horizontal banding um, to be uh, interrupted by um, architectural features, such as bay windows and balconies for up to 30% of the total facade area. Um, and the graphics don't represent that, and they could. Um, so just kind of looping back to that, I, I think that there is room for those sorts of changes, especially for, for the character frontage graphics. But that's an interesting yeah. one because you wonder why it's oh. important for the windows to stack. Um, I mean, just on the upper floor is what, why is that a critical component again for the zoning code? In, in that aspect, it has to do with more of like the historical uh, pattern of development from those it, from that era. It does. But, but again, I, I wanna make sure that we point out that we're not proposing those everywhere. And that uh, our other our other frontages are a lot more relaxed around around that. Yeah. But Kelly, I know you've been trying to say something for a few people. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. I just want to say I so I so empathize with the planning department because you know uh, you you want to have a balance where you know you have peanuts and brittle, um, and everybody wants to be the peanuts. Uh, nobody wants to be the brittle. 
Um, but I, I do think that given the scale um, of some of the background buildings, um, for lack of a better term, uh, that are being built downtown right now, um, that you run the risk of having all brittle, no peanuts, um, you know, to really belabor the metaphor. And I, I do wonder if there were perhaps slightly less uh, specificity in the diagrams where things don't look like exactly like windows or exactly like balconies, um, but they're more sort of diagrammatic with hatches or, or something like that, um, that it may help uh, um, clarify the intent of the structure of the frontage uh, in terms of, you know, massing form, that kind of thing without uh, really telling people exactly what to do. I think there really needs to oh, be- Oh, Michelle, you're, you're muted. I think there really needs to be a question here about, you know, where exactly the historic core, you know, what the boundaries of the historic core are. And, and to uh, pick up Kelly's metaphor, um, I, I, I completely agree, you know, good, boring buildings that are good buildings are, are part of the city, definitely. But the peanuts have to be of, of a certain quality. And I, my question is, are we, you know, at being asked to mimic a, a mediocre building from 1910 because it's from 1910? I, I'm questioning, I mean, you know, I think the historic core, the Broadway has a fabric, but I'm not sure how many peanuts there are on Broadway. And I, I you know, I, people can throw stones, but I'm an Angelino, I get to say that. I'm not sure how many of these buildings are excellent, right? And I think an excellent new building next to a, it can, can honor a good historic building in other ways. So, I, you know, it's complicated, um, but I, I think that's really important, you know. But what is, how, how, how wide is that net gonna be thrown? And what is it? that we're being asked to mimic? Is it really of that kind of quality? Well, there's a difference between authentic vintage and uh, you know, a, a reproduction. Um, and that's where I think the architects start to get nervous. I just want to interrupt real quick. I, I know we're limited with time and I want to be respectful of everybody, especially um, the architects involved here and the, you know, the city planners. Um, there were a few questions in the chat, Michelle, that I would love to address because I think they're kind of more big picture and they're more, and they actually can be answered in a way that's, uh, but to me, the questions are really related to how this initial, uh, maybe a reiteration of how it's rolled out citywide community plan by community plan, but also from Rick's questions, it really has more to do with the housing element update and the arena rezoning program. And then maybe if we could just see how all this is fitting in sort of a big picture point of view that that might be something that will be helpful. So I don't know if this is something that uh, Michelle you want to address or Eric and Aaron and Claire or if anyone else. Well, I, I think Claire would be the best person to answer the, um, the housing production question. Um, she would have the, the latest stats from the downtown plan. But I do want to, um, I want to make sure that we cover kind of our last um, facilitated discussion questions as well. So um, I'll hand it off to Claire if you wanna um, help answer some of those questions about the bigger picture. Sure, thanks Michelle. Yeah, so as, as you saw earlier in the presentation, the community plan is, is really looking to accommodate a certain amount of growth. Um, and in this case, the community plan is looking to accommodate um, even beyond what what SCAG has projected, um, you know, helping the city to to meet these overall growth numbers, um, the you know the housing element is currently being updated, and with that is a new set of uh, arena numbers that the city will be looking to accommodate, and there are a number of strategies in the draft housing element. I I highly recommend that all of you take a look at that if you get the chance. Um, I think there's some really innovative ideas about um, how we can accommodate our, our housing goals in the city. Um, so that will kind of happen both through citywide efforts like the update to the housing element, 
um, and there are there are proposed programs within the housing element that are related to citywide um, code efforts, as well as again community plan by community plan each update looking to accommodate um, a certain amount of growth and the the proposed zoning tools will be the main implementation uh, method for us to do that. I think from the zoning code perspective, we've been working with the housing team and sort of laying some groundwork uh, for how these programs might function within the new zoning code. So uh, the programs I outlined, like the public benefit systems is meant to include a lot of these kinds of programs within it. And, you know, depending on which way we go, you know, we'll, we have a few paths that we can take. So we have had early conversations with what they're thinking about so that we can be sort of prepared for when they're ready to propose uh, programs. So I know we're almost at time, but I did wanna ask one final question for the panel. Um, and this is really related to something I think we all can agree with that uh, one of our greatest challenges is to create more walkable, less car centric neighborhoods. And um, I know that you know, the, the new zoning code and the downtown LA community plan have really um, propelled this issue forward. And so, you know, just wanna ask our panel, you know, what are two or three major steps that can be taken to encourage more active transportation and new development? Um, and what are some of the barriers? So um, Claire, Eric, um, or Aaron, do you wanna take this one and um, maybe respond to how, how is the downtown plan addressing walkability and you know, livability? Sure, yeah, well, I think, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about frontages and some of the other form tools that we're proposing to help create more pedestrian friendly environments. But, um, you know, I think a, a number of other provisions within the development standards district, for example, are gonna be really significant in helping move us towards this vision. Um, for example, removing minimum parking requirements. That's probably one of the, the biggest things that we can do to help um, address this issue. And, and that's something that we've seen from looking at other cities, both within the US um, as well as across the world. Um, the parking standards don't, in the development standards districts, don't just talk about how much parking you do or, or do not have to provide, but also how that should be designed. And we've included a provision requiring that above grade parking be adaptable, so designed with flat floors, ceilings of a certain height. Um, again, really looking to offer flexibility for the future so that um, the space can be repurposed, hopefully, as um, we move more towards our, our multimodal goals um, and, and VMT reduction. In terms of the, the code as a whole and, you know, moving forward, we've We've elevated, we actually introduced an elevated pedestrian access uh, within our new zoning code. So we have pedestrian access standards uh, is one of the first things you'll see in the development, Article 4 development standards districts. Um, we also have a lot of our frontages have a focus on entrances, the number and spacing of them, uh, you know, depending on the type of street. Um, and then there's like uh, the uh, uh, maximum building with, uh, you know, where paseos and other kinds of uh, spaces could start to be uh, introduced. Uh, but I think one of the things I'm excited for is maybe some of the kind of longer range things we've been thinking about, which is a, a form of like zoning a sidewalk uh, and having different sidewalk typologies and standards that are associated with them. You know, I'm, I'm excited for the possibility of what we'd be working on in the future with that. Uh, and we'd love to have uh, AIA engaged in that effort as well. And, you know, I think for me, the formula for, uh, for a great space is what happens on the private property, but also what happens in, within the public realm and on the other side of that street as well. So um, having more conversation around that as we build out that functionality, because uh, again, the new zoning code is meant to be more modular and having new modules developed to plug into the system. Uh, and that's that big emphasis on uh, addressing the needs that we have today, but also the ones that we have tomorrow and that we may not know about. So, yeah. Michelle, you're on mute, Michelle. 
Oh, sorry. sorry. Okay. <laughs> Especially with our expanded <laughs> transit system and, you know, um, we're looking at a future with many more stations. So, you know, really, how do you um, begin to plan for, you know, a walkable future Los Angeles? Um, so I just, I know we're, um, we're at about our time. Um, any final thoughts from the panelists? Um, I know that we're going to be holding some uh, working sessions to test projects in downtown Los Angeles. And, you know, if you can let us know, I think this has been a great opener. Um, if there are issues that you've identified over the years um, that you'd like to address that we, we haven't talked about yet in today's discussion or, uh, you know, additional themes that you want to unpack from the zoning code, um, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. Um, or, you know, from the planning teams, if there's the particular standard or code section where we'd like to receive um, AIA's feedback, um, this would be a great opportunity. Well, I know I've said this many times on other calls, but we really do want to be helpful. And I know testing will definitely be helpful so we can evaluate really what, what's happening with the code. And I, I know even, you know, I have the tendency to just be critical and not offer an alternative. It's really hard. I, it's hard for you guys to develop what the alternative would be, but it seems to me that maybe next time we can focus and try to come to the table with some real alternatives. You know, that what, what other ways could we do this? You know, like maybe there should be more incentives in the alternative compliance so that someone would actually do it. You know, it's that, that kind of thing. I appreciate the struggle and want to, want to help out the most I can. Yeah, I wanted to say that I, it, although it is absolutely overwhelming to think I have to take all of that knowledge I now have about the current zoning code, throw it out and learn an entirely new system. Having you know, played around with it this weekend and tried it on some of your case studies, I have to commend you on the fact that once you sort of dive in and try to use it, it's really nicely designed. I think you guys have done a great job at, at, at helping us move through it. And so once you get over the the sense that, oh my God, it's a wall of new information coming at me. Um, it's, I think is, it's a wonderful direction and, and uh, commend you all. Um, well, you I, won't have to forget the old code yet because the, out of the 35 community plans, we're only gonna be one It'll take a while, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I am wondering if there isn't a model that, you know, maybe we can help you is um, uh, of, of being just being more general and more goal oriented, you know, laying out the goals and, and being uh, maybe a little more hands off um, in the big zone in the big citywide zoning code and and leaving the specific things that you're trying to achieve uh, to the community plans. Um, right. I, it, just because those it seems to me that's a place that could be more responsive that is going to be updated more regularly. And maybe that's the kind of interaction we need. Um, but the, so anyways, that's in terms of suggestions, that's my suggestion. Great way so. to look at the code moving forward. It's a, we mean, we mean for it to be a living document and um, it, it'll, it'll, it'll require calibration as we're moving forward. But um, I think uh, Tracy, thank you for the, for the, for noticing because a, a lot of the work that we've put into it has just been in organizing the information and trying to make it as intuitive as possible. Uh, and again, definitely we understand that the, that looking at an 1100 page document can be somewhat daunting, but uh, we mean for it not to be like a book that you read, uh, but it's a, it's a, it's a reference document. So, you know, depending on your zone, you only have a, like a limited number of pages that you really have absolutely positively have to look at. And after that, it's like, it's kind of your pick your own adventure kind of scenario. I just yeah, like the, the interactive from... web links were easier to, to navigate than the whole, um, the whole thing all at once. Uh, so from, uh, you know, Will and everybody at AI LA Go and everybody else involved, I mean, I think having more and tell us, you know, I think everybody wants to contribute and obviously because it affects the way we design, the way we think, so we want to be a part of it. So whatever you think that you need in terms of getting feedback or, and I know that you're well into the process and uh, 
but I think now that we can see see it visually, it's really helpful. And I think we all are beginning to understand it a little bit so that we can be maybe a little bit more helpful. But just to, I think the presentation was great. And Michelle's, your questions, I think you really got the questions, um, kind of what we want to as part of your questions, which is to make the code more nimble, to be responsive to the context and to kind of to changes and to the communities that we're in and to, we do, we also like predictability. So I know that we're saying that we want more opportunities for, for design uh, to be kind of, to not be so restricted in some of those examples. But we also agree that predictability is good because obviously that there's a lot of complaints right now about how unpredictable the process is. And then obviously the desire to have more housing and to have better public transit are all goals that you brought up that are all our goals too. So thank you. Well, great. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Um, and, and yeah, I think we, we can open it up to um, the larger group discussion if folks want to stay on and, you know, ask any questions. Similarly, we have the office hours where we can sort of act as your de facto planning consultants in navigating the new code. Uh, if you're looking through uh, and, you know, any individual project you might be working on or, or maybe utilizing one of the hypothetical sites that we provided. Um, we'd be happy to help in that way too. Yeah, yeah thanks, Eric. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, Rick, you, you're on the call still. Do you wanna ask a few of your questions? They were sort of big picture and I think you have a really excellent point to make. So Rick, are you there? Yes, here, if you can hear me here. Um, I guess my point is uh, here is I'm, I'm concerned about uh, our focus on the trees and maybe not the city planning forest a bit. And all I can think of is Greg Morrow's research about the history of our city planning code and how we've been down zoned from a city of 10 million to a city of 4 million. And the, the first thing I want to understand currently with the proposal for the uh, city uh, planning new code is how far, how much, what is our capacity now under your proposal? Are we are at 4 million? Are we at six? Are we at eight? Are we back to 10 million where we were in 1962? Or are we trying to exceed that for the future? I think uh, I'll let Claire talk about the downtown specifics, but a big picture. Uh, I think uh, the unbundling of the density requirement from the development potential is probably a step towards a, a probably more housing units than might, might have all, uh, been possible in the past. I think one of the drawbacks with today's zoning is that uh, a certain density comes with a certain size building, which may or may not actually even have affordable uh, affordability kind of calibrated into it. Because the bigger the units are, the less affordable they are. That you know, in terms, unless you have a lot of them. Uh, so what we're trying to do is uh, create a more nuanced tool that allows our community planners to sort of integrate more density in a more elegant manner mm -hmm. uh, that that fits better with the neighborhood. So you can have like a large size home with multiple units if that was a policy objective for part of the city. So you end up with the more of the mansion apartments or, um, or have uh, more of the missing middle uh, opportunities, uh, you know, possibility uh, the possibility of having an alternate typology that waives parking requirements or just reduces it so that those things are possible. Because I think one of the things that was, what is clear to us, at least from a planning perspective, is that uh, one of the biggest obstacles is uh, a lot of our uh, additional development standards that go along with uh, our multifamily zoning. Uh, so a lot of those buildings aren't possible today. So we can start working out those kinds of solutions. Yeah, I think um, I would just like to clarify again here that, you know, the the new zoning code is really creating, right, this new set of tools that we can use throughout the city as we move forward updating our community plans. but it's only being applied right now in downtown through the downtown community plan update. So looking at, at growth capacity and, and um, planning for population in the future, right now we're really only looking at, at the downtown community plan area. Um, and uh, you know, we'd be happy to, maybe Eric, if you can pull up that slide again that shows 
uh, the downtown plan capacity. Um, if you're interested in kind of learning more about, about the citywide picture, again, I really recommend um, looking at some of the housing element update materials. They have been doing a lot of really great outreach um, and there's, there's more outreach to come on that effort. But I think certainly, as I mentioned earlier, one of the primary goals of, of the downtown community plan update is accommodating significant uh -huh. growth because we do recognize that that downtown is is well suited um, for a number of reasons, particularly transit access for this kind of growth. And right. that's really been been central to this effort. So if I could respond to that real quick, I, I appreciate what you're talking about here and, and what the slide represents. And, and it, it makes sense that you might start with um, uh, downtown, the downtown plan is sort of the DNA of what might happen subsequently throughout the rest of the city in, you know, different, different proportions and different variations. So that, that all makes sense. But relative to this slide, uh, the first question that I have is, okay, I can see that you've planned for growth and a bit of excess growth or growth beyond what seems to be uh, needed at our best case from SCAG, et cetera, right now. That seems good, but I would like to know, how does this compare with other cities that we already do know in terms of what their, you know, what their quality of life and their economy, et cetera, would be like? So I would wanna know is, well, is this somehow, uh, do these numbers represent something like Milan or is it more like San Francisco or is it more like Singapore? I don't have a real, I don't have any bearings to ground these numbers into something that you know we can correlate in terms of urban life and 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 you know uh, urban design. And so my first question in the in the chat was, well, what were the case studies that were used in your process to start developing this? Because I want to understand it and how are we stacking up uh, uh, compared to other cities either in the United States or even worldwide. Well, and I guess I can answer that um, somewhat, although I wasn't involved in the downtown LA uh, process, um, but I can say, you know, from, you know, experience working on the, the West LA community plan update many, many years ago and others, it is incredibly challenging to um, upzone neighborhoods in the absence of good design examples of how this can be done, um, you know, appropriately, um, how, how to get the, um, the, the four plexes and the duplexes that we want to see um, in areas that are prime for, you know, mixed, um, mixed density. Um, it's just really, I think what's really um, exciting about the new zoning code and the way that the, the frontage and this, this, the whole structure has been created is that it creates these base, um, general provisions everywhere. And then beyond that, you can really work closely with communities. I know, um, for example, the Valley teams, uh, the Valley community plan teams are looking at doing um, some significant upzoning in transit neighborhood plan areas. And, you know, really looking, they're looking to see what the reaction is to downtown LA. And then next is Boyle Heights. And Boyle Heights is a little bit you know, it's not like the valley, but it's a little bit more like a valley scale. Um, and so, you know, I think as we learn, as we go through the city, um, there are so many different typologies in, in the different neighborhoods and um, eras of construction to contend with. Um, but what I can say is that um, what's really exciting is that for the first time we can really tailor our zoning to the individual community wishes um, and really provide something that helps to um, get people comfortable with the idea of density. That's how we get there. I think, you know, that that is kind of the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems to me also, I mean, I think it's a smart strategy uh, from a policy standpoint to put together this kit of, uh, kit of parts in terms of you know, this modularity, which, which means you can, you know, upscale with the same set of rules and, you know, uh, bump up the density in one particular place and move it around in different ways. So I think that's, that's really commendable as an approach, but there's still a bigger picture uh, that I think needs to 
happen. And it, it's, it's probably gets a little bit beyond uh, the, the scope of the city planning department and it gets into the scope of the city council and everybody else as well. But I think city planning needs to be able to guide the politics a bit and say, hey, you know, we have to accommodate 300,000 ho housing units in the next six years or whatever it is, whatever the number is. It seems like every, every article I read, it's a little bit different, but we know that there's gotta be in every council district, 17 council districts, that there's gotta be, you know, say uh, 100,000 housing units that have to be found. If, ev if every council district has to do their fair share and take 1 17th of the demand, the question is, where does it go? And how do you, how do you help uh, the politics towards a, a good urban design solution with that? So I think there's that big, the forest needs to be uh, better understood in terms of how big is this forest, how tall are the trees? And then, you know, you're starting to develop the tools to make it, to manage it well, I think, but there's still this big set of questions that really need, need some, kind of, uh, some kind of answer. And the answer isn't, isn't going to be pat, it's going to be evolving for sure. Um, but I think we need to get a place where we can figure ourselves situate ourselves in terms of the the enormity of our problem yeah i think yeah. you outlined our work program for the next uh 10 years 10 to 20 years. <laughs> i was gonna say the same thing eric that this is um this is our struggle you know um what we spend our whole careers working on is you know how do you get you know each part of the city to to take on its fair share um and you know, the timing of that as well, because we can't work on all the community plans at one time. So we have these um, citywide elements that guide us, like the housing element. Mm -hmm. And then it's really up to um, the conversation that happens at the community plan by community plan level. So right. um, very, you know, fortunately, we're in a, a housing element cycle right now. So we can we, we lay the groundwork for that mm -hmm. difficult conversation with communities. But I think this zoning code is, is, is hopefully a, a strong part of us figuring mm -hmm. out how to move forward. I think a big part of the problem today is like the zoning regulations today, uh, the answer to what can I do on my property is it's almost always going to be, well, it depends. <laughs> right. uh, whereas this one is more, uh, more predictable. Uh, so we can start projecting what the possibilities are a little bit more. They're more definitive. Uh, so it'll help to facilitate that discussion. And then answers to the questions that you asked are uh, would guide whatever we end up putting in the code to help make those things happen. Well, you know, getting back to that, this, the, the, um, the smartness about this idea is that as I'm thinking it through, and I haven't really read through it, you know, technically to understand if this is in fact the case, but um, if the this modular system is truly as flexible as you're talking about it gives it it, it, re, it potentially could remove a very important nimby lever that is used on every project in the city saying oh i'm going to hold we're going to hold you you developer or project uh hostage for a certain amount of time because we know how long it takes to get what you guys really want from either the developer or city planning or whatever. And we're, we're the architects in the middle trying to make it all work and make it, make it a, a decent, uh, decent environment. But it's that leverage that communities have that they're using the bureaucracy and the zoning code uh, uh, at cross purposes of these public purposes. And I think that's, that's, I'm hoping that this is how it pans out, which means every potential project opponent has got to understand is oh they could upzone this area and you know like that because they've got the module that allows us to do this theoretically so there's still some safeguards in there in terms of uh, general plan uh designations and there the corresponding zoning system is still going to be there so there's going to be some guardrails to what's possible uh and i think i think what we're trying to focus on is creating a a, a stronger implementation tool that's a lot more aligned with our, our our plans, right? I think I mean, per, you know, that's that's what it should be. A, a good code implements its long range plans, uh, and so you know, depending on what it is the vision is, you know, we have the ability to create these different modules within it. So uh -huh. um, that's kind of okay. what we're looking for. Yeah. Right. Sorry, I just I wanted to hop in. I did want to um, just ask a question to the group since I know that time's running low, um, and I 
I'm going to take advantage of having access to so many architects. Um, so hi, everybody who doesn't know me. My name is Emma Howard. I'm the director of planning for Councilmember de Leon. Um, we are obviously listening to all the input on the community plans because the council will be ultimately deciding on ad adaptation of DTLA 2040, and it is the first major recode plan in the city. So um, everybody's input is critical, and we may not have time to go into this, but one of the questions that our office has been asking um, when we get a chance is kind of other code that might intersect with recode and how that's kind of um, challenging you or holding you, um, and maybe not even just code, but also fees. Um, so obviously there's a parks fee, uh, there's a linkage fee, uh, there's lid, uh, there's, um, you know, our energy efficiency, green designs, there's uh, dedications and improvements on the sidewalk and side streetscape. And so I don't know that we're going to be able to kick into this today, but certainly when our office is dealing with stuff, um, for those of you who are affordable housing designers, uh, there's a lot of regulatory back and forth stuff that's not just in the zoning code, but might be in building and safety code or fire code. Um, it's worth just kind of highlighting that at this moment where we're dealing with downtown, the planning department can only see what the planning department regulates. Um, and I would be really interested in those places where things kind of crisscross. Um, another question to kind of kick out to the group. And again, I don't need answers today, but we are gonna have hearings soon. Um, would also be emerging uses that you're seeing, clients that are coming to you with ideas that are not yet permissible in the code. Um, because uh, for instance, cloud kitchens, I think there's a, a sort of an alcohol question or an entertainment question. That's a kind of brand new use. Um, there's a lot of office flex spaces that I certain, I like Ani giving, I think sent out like a whole office vision that I'm not sure the code actually supports at this point in time. So just kind of throwing those things out as um, maybe teasers for the next discussion that Will's going to set up is our office. We'd be very interested to hear your input on those pieces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the I legislature think can help with that. That's a great, great idea. I think we were going to hopefully ask this group, not just the, the panelists, but everyone in attendance, uh, if they had a list of like annoying provisions. <laughs> Uh, I think uh, one of one of the one of the, my favorites lists that I've seen so far because we have worked with other organizations and architects uh, the the uh, the silly and stupid code <laughs> list that, that that was shared with us uh, like uh, different provisions from different codes not just our own planning code uh, that 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 did help guide a lot of what we've done in terms of modifications to the to the zoning from what today's rules are and what we're proposing so yeah we would love to hear uh, what people's lists are about things that are generally holding back things that we want to see. Yeah. Oh, and um, skyscraper vision, I think, is another question. You know, um, I think there's a question that we haven't really asked in Los Angeles because we're a city of low to mid rise for the most part. Um, how should a building be different over different heights? I think Tracy started kicking that around with sort of the, the question about once you get above a certain story, what does this matter, right? Balcony requirements on the 40th floor may need to be a little different than balcony requirements on the fifth floor. And so I think that's another kind of question we want to start um, kicking yeah, around. I think that, that I mean, this would be a great conversation to set up for like a whole other session, uh, Will, if you're willing to help facilitate something like that. Uh, I think maybe we can show you where we might have already addressed some of the things that you might be concerned about because uh, we have heard from other folks. Or we can just think about ways that we might kind of maybe not even not, not necessarily address it, but maybe address it or ways that we could we, we start thinking about how we could possibly do some of those things. Um, so, yeah, yeah def definitely. Well, and I, I see that we're almost at, at time. So I just want to, um, you know, just give a, a big round of thanks to um, AIA to Will for helping to facilitate this meeting. It's been really helpful for uh, all of us. And I've learned a lot in this session. So well, thank you to Will and, and um, all of the participants and the panelists. Thanks everyone. Yeah, thanks Michelle, Eric, Aaron, and Claire. We, we will be in touch. And for everyone else on this call, please get in touch with me directly and I'll share the Zoom links for all the working sessions. We're extremely delighted to have the uh, involvement, the leadership of Los Angeles City Planning. This is a huge tall work order. As Eric mentioned, this has been going on for eight years 
and we probably have about another six to 12 months in the process of the, at least the zoning code. But, um, you know, this is a living document. And this is an opportunity for all architects and designers to share, um, share you know, our, our input. So with that, I'll, I'll let everyone get back to their work day.